Hi everyone and welcome back to my YouTube channel. I'm back with another writing video, but first you will notice I'm in a new location and I have a microphone. Third, I'm sitting on the floor. I hope that is okay with you guys because we should be comfortable when we're talking about writing. Anyway, so what this video is about, I'm going to be teaching you some technical writing tips that you could use when you're editing your prose because the point of these tips is not necessarily to incorporate them as you're writing because writing, you're just getting the words out. However, these tips are going to clean up your writing and sharpen your prose. You could use them for your Instagram captions. You could use them for your creative nonfiction pieces. You could use them for academic essays, literally anything. So let's get started. Also, I do recommend watching the last YouTube video first if you haven't already. I know the audio is terrible, but think of my YouTube channel like a syllabus, cumulative, Every video I upload is going to add to the previous one, so you should understand that information before you proceed to the next one. So tip number one is to use stronger verbs for descriptions. Most people go with some form of the verb to be, like saying, Jamie is beautiful. However, a stronger way to say that is Jamie radiated beauty. Now another example, instead of saying, Jamie is different from Becky, you can say, Jamie differs from Becky. And you might be thinking that this is such a subtle change, like why does this matter? You don't want your sentences to read like everyone else's sentences. So anyone can say, she is funny, she is nice, she is special. You wanna think of unique ways to get your point across. So also you don't have to say, Jamie is inspiring. You could say, Jamie inspires me or everyone. And I also like this example because now you know, who does she inspire? Is it you? Is it everyone? Is it the whole town? So pretty much most adjectives, you can find the verb way to say it instead. So try to think outside the traditional she is, was. Okay, my next tip is a little more grammar intensive, so I'll try to explain it as best as I can because I understand not everyone majored in English in college or looked at grammar past middle school. But a proposition is a word that it usually connotates location, like from, in, under, above, um, of, that's a big one that you'll see a lot. So that's a preposition. You don't want your sentence to contain too many prepositions because they're very clunky and they're going to obscure the meaning of the, the sentence because you have so many locations and details in it that are not necessary. So fortunately, they are very easy to cut down. The two main tips are to either A, use a contraction. Contractions are your best friend. Or B, make the noun an adjective. So what I mean by that, I will give examples. Don't worry, every tip I give in this video, I'm going to provide lots of examples. But anyway, instead of saying, you have the sentence, I cleaned the junk in my drawer. You can say, I cleaned my junk drawer. So the, the word junk, that's the noun. And we know a noun is a person, place, or thing. So instead of saying, junk in my drawer, I called it a junk drawer. It means the same thing. So I got rid of the word in and condensed it. Or, like I said, contractions. Contractions are your best friend when it comes to prepositions. You could make the sentence, I cleaned my drawer's junk. Similarly, let's, let's take the um, sentence, I cleaned the mess in my room. I cleaned my room's mess. So already there, we have eliminated the preposition in. So those were sentences with one clause, one prepositional clause. Similarly, I borrowed the shirt from my sister. The from my sister is the prepositional clause. So we changed it to, I borrowed my sister's shirt. However, things are going to get a little trickier now because now I'm going to provide you a long sentence and this is where too many prepositions really gets ugly. You're going to hear. I wrote it down. I have to read it because I did not memorize this sentence. I went to the convenience store in my neighborhood to buy candy for Jamie. That's four prepositions in one sentence. Two in two four. That's a lot. And you might be thinking, I went to the convenience store in my neighborhood to buy candy for Jamie. It doesn't sound terrible, but writing and reading is so subconscious that people don't necessarily realize, like if you're not into writing, the way I am, when I read a writer, I can tell you this, look at what they did here. This sentence is beautiful. I see what they did with um, this theme and the simile. Like I can point out what makes it good. But for someone who's not into reading or writing, they'll read something and they might not think it's bad, but they won't process it afterwards. Like, wow, that's amazing. So a lot of those little details, they're subconscious. And 
I think the same for music also. Like, I know nothing about music, but if I hear a piece of music, I'll think it's amazing, whereas other ones, I won't think it's amazing, and I won't be able to tell you why. It's just something about it. So I hope that makes sense. But I wish I didn't go off on this tangent in the middle of this lesson, because now I have to read the sentence over so we know where we are. I went to the convenience store in my neighborhood to buy candy for Jamie. Clunky sentence. So listen to my rewrite. I went to my neighborhood store to buy Jamie candy. So do you see what we did there? We turned neighborhood into an adjective and we already know that the candy is for Jamie. So I omitted the preposition to buy Jamie candy. It's for her. That's okay in English. So it's like, once you understand the rules, you know how to maneuver them. See how in that sentence, we cut down from four prepositions to two. Now I personally, I might not catch that when I'm writing it, but when I'm editing, I will. So all these tips, I don't want you to freak out while you're writing. They're just something to keep in mind for the future when you're editing. And my next tip, this is tip number three, and we are going to be discussing adverbs. So you gotta chill with them. A lot of people use way too many adverbs because they want to be more descriptive. However, you don't need to do that with an adverb. You can do it with a stronger verb. So for example, instead of saying, she angrily walked through the door. Why don't you say, she stomped through the door. She trudged through the door. So already we cut out a word and we substitute it for a stronger verb. So I love verbs. That's why the first, um, what's the word? First tip I gave, strong verbs. And then you won't need an adverb. Secondly, if you are going to use an adverb, ask yourself if it's necessary because the verb might be strong. For example, you wouldn't say she angrily stomped through the door. I'm pretty sure you don't stomp if you're happy. And if you're going to say she happily kissed him, would there be a reason that she would unhappily kiss him? Because usually kissing is a happy thing. So instead of using an adverb, you can set the scene through the details. Like maybe you could say she turned away, um, she glanced to the side and like pulled back instead of saying unhappy. Because like I said, this is why I said you should watch the creative nonfiction video because the point there is to paint the picture. So words are telling the story, but you want to use verbs to really show the action and what's happening. And that's why the characters are acting the way they do. Another one, she cried profusely. Let's make it. She wept, she bawled, she sobbed. I think that paints a much stronger image and my next tip, number four, is an extension of number three because, fun fact, adverb, most people assume that it's an adjective that modifies a verb and that's why they frequently have the word, uh, not word, um, ly at the end. But adverbs also add, um, modify, sorry, I can't speak right now. They also modify adjectives. So the words very, extremely, super, that's modifying an adjective. So if you're sensing a theme throughout this YouTube video, you're gonna cut those out also. Instead of using adverbs, we want strong adjectives. Yeah, those words vary super extremely, those modifiers, big no-no. We always wanna cut those out and find better adjectives. So instead of saying, she's very sad, you could say, she's devastated, she's heartbroken. And instead of saying, she's very happy, she's thrilled, she's elated, she's ecstatic. And then angry, she's very angry, she's enraged, furious, infuriated. So yeah, those are so, some examples for adjectives. My biggest pet peeve is when people add the words very to these extreme words. She's very heartbroken. She's very devastated. She's very miserable. No, the word is supposed to do all the talking. So if you add very, like how much more miserable is she than the miserable that the word means? You know what I mean? Like the word already signifies the extreme. So very doesn't do anything we have on the opposite end of the spectrum when people weaken the adjectives saying slightly somewhat a bit no you can just find a weaker adjective so you can't say somewhat exhausted because exhausted means exhausted if you're somewhat exhausted you're not exhausted so you could say she's sleepy tired or if you said she's somewhat furious slightly furious I'm slightly furious no you're peeved, frustrated. So my overarching message with this tip is to understand the message you're trying to get across. The description you have in your mind. Is it somewhat of the thing or is it very much of the thing? Because once you know the level you're trying to describe, you can find the adjective that suits it. 
rather than adding very or somewhat to it because that's not how you grow and don't be afraid to use the dictionary don't be afraid to use the thesaurus you'll increase your vocabulary and have an array of words at your fingertips so what you could also do is if you really want to convey an emotion, you can use a simile instead of just saying she was ecstatic because you want to say she's very excited. So you say she's ecstatic. You could say she was as excited as a kid in a candy store. So that is where the simile comes in. Now, personally, I love similes because I think words only go so far. But when you can give someone a visceral emotion that they can imagine and really understand how heartbroken, excited, elated someone feels, it's, your writing is going to have a lot stronger of a resonation. The final tip for this video is to cut out empty phrases, well, cliches. They're kind of the same thing. I wrote down the most common ones, my least favorites. The truth is, the fact of the matter is, at the end of the day, when it comes down to it, bottom line, truthfully, honestly, just say what you need to say. You don't have to preface it with one of these. The only word I use that somewhat falls in the category of these is the word frankly, but I use it in an ironic sense when I'm negating the previous sentence because the, the next sentence is providing counter information. So for example, um, strangers think I'm snobby because I don't say hi to them. Frankly, I'm so shy, I don't even say hi to people I know. But you don't need to use it in every sentence. Use it sparingly for the most part. You really can just write what you want to write and you don't need to preface it with any of these cliches. So that's all I've got today. I did not want this video to get too long. I might do a part two. I just wanted to keep this video kind of along the theme of condensing. And like I said, when you're doing your first draft, just get it all on paper because my toxic trait is that I will like write a sentence and then go back and reread it. Write another sentence, go back and reread it. And that is very time consuming. If you found this video useful, please like and subscribe and comment below what you wanna see in the next video. If you have any suggestions for me, I'm willing to teach you guys whatever you wanna know. Thank you and I will see you in the next one.